Well, dear students, here we are at our final chapter covering stocks. We've come a long way. And we are going to end with <laughs> the most supreme silliness that is associated with stocks, in my humble opinion. But first, we'll take a look at some important topics to understand, not that we have that much control over them, and that is what we call behavioral finance and the psychology of investing. This is nothing new, folks. Benjamin Graham said it a long time ago very, very well. The investor's chief problem, and even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself or herself. And this is the truth. This is the truth. As we saw in Chapter 4 when we saw that mutual funds do better than the mutual fund investors, the people who invest in them. Why? Because they get in at the absolute worst possible time. Ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Everybody else has made a fortune. I want to make some too. And then they drop out. They pull out at the very worst possible time after the market tanks. Ooh, ooh, ooh is it too late to get out? <laughs> so let's take a look at behavioral finance and the psychology of investing. Slide number two. Investor what? Uh, psychology, the study of psychos. <laughs> I prefer to call it slycology. You like that? That's an old joke. I use slycology on them. <laughs> In 1962, there was a brief recession and a sharp market downturn. The president's chief economic advisor was giving a presentation to many of the political and economic leaders of the time, describing what they were doing to right the economy. One of the attendees asked, So when is the stock market going to recover? The advisor curtly responded, I am an economist, sir, not a psychiatrist. Yeah. Slide number three. Because of the tremendous amount of money involved in the markets, much research has gone into trying to understand investor psychology. Some of the research is very revealing about who and what we are, not only as investors, but also as a species in general. In other words, uh, it tells us about humans. It tells us about about our, our uh, traits and uh, quirks and idiot syncricities, idiosyncrasies. There's an old Wall Street saying, there are three factors that influence the market. Fear, greed, and greed. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you hear people say fear and greed, but it's usually fear and greed and greed. Greed usually wins out <laughs> over the long term. Not always. There are times when fear is running rampant. But greed, boy, people are just, yeah, yeah. Slide number four. Here are some common investor weaknesses. Reading too much into the recent past. Beware the permanent trend. This looks familiar, right? Yeah, we saw this in Chapter 7. The permanent trend is a cute saying quoted by Andrew Tobias. Things have going, been going really, really well. They must continue to go really, really well forever. R wrong. Things are going really, really badly. They're going to continue to go really... No, 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 no. Even though there are countless examples of investors getting on the bandwagon, just as the wagon was about to veer into a ravine, we trick ourselves into believing that it's different this time. It's a new era. So you have to go back and look at yourself and see if you are one of those people who loves to jump on the bandwagon at the worst possible time. Did you pile into Apple or gold in 2011 and 12? Hmm? Did you buy oil in mid-2008 when it was $147 a barrel and eight months later it gone down to $39 a barrel? How did that condo conversion flipper in early 2006 work out for you? Oh, not so good, huh? Oh, yeah. And then eToys, The Globe, CMGI, DrCoop.com. 
You don't remember any of these, do you? Web grocer, home, what was it, web grocer? Web van and, and home grocer. Those were two companies that were going to deliver groceries to you. You you put the, your outer in over the Internet, and you are going to have your groceries delivered to your doors. And they spent a ton of money. They bought all these $100,000 trucks that were with, you know, with refrigeration and all the things in them. Spectacular bankruptcies, and those trucks were sold for you know twenty, thirty percent, <laughs> brand new, barely used. Uh -huh. So don't read too much into the recent past. The only thing constant is change. Slide number five: misperceiving randomness. Even though stock price movements in the short term are random, that's what our research shows us. Our brains will trick us into seeing a pattern. We humans are heuristic. What does that mean? It means we look for patterns. Even if we know, or someone has told us, there is no pattern to be found. There aren't any to be found. We will, our brains will say, yeah, there's a pattern there. There's another pattern there. And, and it's just something that we do. It's, it's not something, it's, it's built into our genes to, 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 to find those patterns, even if we're told, no, this is no, there's no pattern. This is completely random. And this is an example here. If you study randomness and statistics, you will find that in a series of one million random digits, you know, zeros through nines for a million, you know, million of them in a row, the probability that one of those digits, anyone, you don't know which one, but zero through nine, will be repeated 13 times in a row is essentially 100%. So if you have a computer or some other device that is creating random digits, and you create a million random digits, and you don't see one of those numbers repeated 13 times in a row, then you know that somebody's fudged the random number generator. Somebody's fudged the randomness. Because if you're a human and you're looking at those one million digits and you see 13 sixes in a row, you would say, this isn't random. Are you with me? Understand? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we see a pattern where there's none to be found. And in my humble opinion, technical analysts are guilty of this failing. And we're going to discuss that at the end of this presentation. We'll discuss technical on that. Well, not the end. It takes up you know, ha over half of the presentation. We've been mentioning technical anal analysis. Now we're going to actually uh, spend some time doing it. But slide number six, continuing with the common investor weaknesses, is being overconfident. Believing you know more than you think you know or believing you're better than most other investors, the truth is, folks, we are very, very small individual investors. We only see the tip of the iceberg with regard to what is happening within a company or an industry or the economy as a whole. And we are usually only average or mediocre investors at best, especially if we decide to try trading or speculating, then, as we've seen, we're up against the best in the business, yeah, and there's a name for this, it's called the Lake Wobegon effect, huh, later, hang on a minute, first, I want to, I want you to answer this question, are you an excellent, good, average, fair, or poor driver, and if you get 100 people in a room and ask them, over 80%, sometimes up to 90%, will say they are either excellent or good. A few will say they're average, and virtually none will say that they're fair or poor. Exactly. How can everybody be above average? Well, that's the Lake Wobegon effect. And you probably have never heard Garrison Keillor's news from Lake Wobegon, but dear students, it's a joy. And in my humble opinion, other people will say, it's too slow. But it's, on, it's been on public radio for almost 40 years. And this gentleman by the name, he's a very excellent writer, uh, Garrison Keillor, has a tagline for his news from Lake Wobegon. He talks about this mythical uh, place 
where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Right, how can everybody be above average? Well, that's the, that's the truth, you know. Um, uh, we all think we're really good and excellent drivers, and the truth is, no, we're mostly all average, and some of us are not so good at all. And the same thing is true for investors. If they think they're really, really good, and they're going to go up against the best in the business by being speculators and traders, all I can wish them is good luck. Slide number seven. Selling your winners too soon Hanging, hanging on to your losers. Now, we've discussed this a little bit in Chapter 7. It's called loss aversion. As humans, we hate to admit that we made a mistake. So we stubbornly hold on to our losers, hoping that they will at least get back to where we bought in so that we can say that we didn't make a mistake. Oh, we just, you know, it was just uh, neutral. Uh-huh. <laughs> Think of the opportunity cost of hanging on to that. The reality, folks, is we are hardwired, so to speak. Our memories are wired, are set up, are, are, are configured to forget about unpleasant experiences. That's what we are. That helps us cope. So if you sell your losers, you'll quickly forget about them. They'll, they'll disappear from your conscious. However, if you hang on to them, Every time you look at that screen or look at your statement, you're going to be reminded how stupid you were, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's as if we're masochistic and we're, and we're be, so we don't admit that we make a mistake. We want to f watch ourselves and, and, and beat ourselves up every time we look at the screen. In contrast, if you hang on to your winners, that's what makes an investor rich. You have a good company, has good long-term prospects, Hang on to it. Hold it forever, as Mr. Buffett says. Ah, you know, and, uh, and I think I told you this about Mr. Um, about Peter Lynch when he was asked what his worst mistake was, his worst investing mistake. And he said, you know, when, it, when Home Depot came out, I bought it and it went up 100%. I doubled my money and I sold. And people, what? That's the worst mistake you made? <laughs> it's not too bad. He goes, yeah, yes it is. It then went up 20 more times. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hang on to your winners. Slide number eight. Okay, those were common investor weaknesses and, and I want you to make sure you know those and be aware of them because they're going to affect you too. You're, you're, you're an investor. Let's now review and take a look back at chapters 5 and I'm sorry 6 and 17 with regard to fundamental analysis the fundamental analysis is the is the in-depth study of the financial condition and operating results of a firm the method of evaluating securities by attempting to measure the intrinsic value of a particular stock in other words what kind of price can we assign to this uh, stock? And we, we, we learned some valuation models. Fundamental analysts study everything from the overall economy and industry conditions to the financial condition and the management of the companies. Simply put, the value of a stock is influenced by the performance of the company that issued the stock. And the valuation models from Chapter 6 and the, the work we did in Chapter 7, that is fundamental analysis, right? Okay, so that should be review. Some of the fundamentals, the competitive position of the company, don't forget to research their competitors, its composition and growth in sales and earnings, dividends, if they're paying dividends, the profit margins, the dynamics of the company's earnings, are they growing or are they stagnant? What's going on with their competitors? What's the composition and liquidity of co corporate resources? What assets are available? The company's capital structure, how much debt, how much equity? That's called the capitalization of a company. And, and so these are things that we've already gone through. And as we gain experience and wisdom and knowledge, investing we find the ones that are most important to us yeah 
But there are many investors who don't follow the fundamentals. They don't bother with taking a look at the company itself. They are called technical analysts. And so this is the other side of the spectrum. You look at squiggles on a screen. <laughs> exactly. The study of various forces at work in the marketplace and their effect on stock prices. Now, those who adhere to technical analysis believe that they can predict the future value of a stock by analyzing the behavior of the stock price's history and or the overall stock market. They use any one or many of dozens of what are called technical indicators. Simply put, the future price of a stock is influenced by factors other than the company's fundamental future outlook. So a pure technical analyst wouldn't even bother with any of the fundamentals. Whereas a, fundame a pure fundamental an analyst would not even care about all these technical indicators. Now obviously it's a spectrum. Some people are all to one side or another and some people are in the middle somewhere, use some of this, use a little bit of that. I will tell you my personal bias. I think these people are all wet. <laughs> I think these people uh, are just are are just fooling themselves, literally fooling themselves, as we saw the common uh, one of the common um, investor weaknesses and 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 problems is that they they see patterns, even though. The research shows us that the patterns are completely random. It doesn't matter. But we'll see that. We'll see that as we go along. You have to decide for yourself. Slide number 11. Argument in favor of technical analysis. Well, stock prices do tend to move in tandem to the stock market as a whole. When the market is rising, most, but not all, stocks rise with it. A rising tide lifts all boats is what you will hear people say. When the market is falling, most stocks are brought down with it. Or as Warren Buffett likes to say, when the tide goes out, you can see who was swimming naked. <laughs> I like that. But, but the rebuttal is, hey, that's just supply and demand at work. When stocks are in favor, prices rise. When the economy is doing well, yeah. When stocks come out of favor, well, prices fall. Repeat after me. There has never been a reliable methodology for predicting the short-term behavior of the stock market. You see, folks, there are plenty of unreliable methodologies out there. And there are plenty of people who want to sell you those unreliable methodologies or sell you their um, advice that they use to to predict unreliably the future short-term behavior of the stock market. When there is a reliable one, well, we'll do our best to uh, find out how it works. The only one that was considered, re uh, they had done it, the short-term behavior, was in the 1990s when two Nobel laureates and, um, or was it three Nobel laureates, and, and, and the best bond trader in the world got together and created a company called Long-Term Capital Management. And they were considered to have broken the code, to have figured out how to predict the market in the short term. And they failed miserably. <laughs> just, just, it was just horrible. <coughs> you know, at first it looked really, really good. And then it reminds me of a child getting up and tottering across the room. And then he's doing okay. Uh-oh. Yeah, uh-oh. But this was a bigger uh-oh than somebody falling on their bum. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank had to run in 1998 and bail them out, essentially. And folks, it's like a prequel. It it reads, if you read it, it's called, there's a book called When Genius Fails. And there's a wonderful Nova special called, or no, was it, yeah, it was Nova called The, the Trillion Dollar Bet. And it it's like a, a prequel to the 2007, 8, 2008 disaster of the housing bubble, bubble where many banks and insurance companies uh, had to be bailed out. Yeah, we don't learn, do we? 
<laughs> we don't learn. Okay, slide number 12. Let's take a look at some of the tools of technical analysis. Now, I don't want to pick on this stock market mentor guy, but I like him because he's so sure of himself. If you if you um, go to a few of his uh, publicly available uh, charts, he has you know free one every day or every so often, and you can go to his website, and then he wants you to sign up and listen to his advice and learn how to trade. Again, I don't want you to do that, but that's your decision. It's your money. Uh, so you'll see he will use these tools and he'll be uh he'll be serious about it where I'll use the tools and I'll make light of it I'll I'll make I'll make fun of them. So you have to decide you know who's right and maybe you want to do a little bit of that and maybe you don't it's up to you. So momentum buying the trend is your friend you'll hear people say. But we already showed that that was a very difficult uh strategy at best. Because re it reminds me of musical chairs, right? As long as everybody's having fun, partying, the music's playing, you can keep swapping chairs all you want. But when that music stops playing, yeah, right. Uh, the housing bubble, right? The internet bubble. And they discuss these support levels and these resistance levels. Well, you look at the chart. We're going to see some charts in a bit you'll see that there's a support level. This is a price or level below which a stock or the market the, as a whole is unlikely to fall. Now, where do they come up with this support level? They just empirically say, look, it, it went down to $10 a share three times, so that's the support level. It won't go below that until it does, that it breaks out on the downside. And then there's a resistance level. That's a price, say, $15. That it won't go above because look, it hit 15 and then fell back and hit 15 and fell back and hit 15 and fell back and then it broke out on the upside. Eh. We'll see, you decide whether or not you trust these things. The psychological bar barriers, people for some reason like zeros, they like round numbers. And I'll tell you, I get excited when my car goes over 99,999 to 100,000 or whatever. Actually, it's getting closer to 200,000. But but um, but uh, the Dow hitting 16,000 or you know, 20,000. Now the next, I guess the next big barrier is 20,000. But it's got to get through 17, 18, 19 first, and maybe it goes down to 15, 14, 30. Who cares? I'm not like talk to me in 10 years. That's what I'm interested in. The S&P at 1,800, $100 for a stock. That's a psychological barrier. And then this other. Last technical ad, a, analysis indicator on this slide is the moving average. Now, this one's kind of interesting. This one's kind of interesting because it's a calculation that, without the use of computers, would take you forever. But with a computer, it's a snap. And you go back 50 days or 15 days or 200 days, and you calculate the average for the last 50 days. And then the next day... You do it again. You go back 50 days. And you chart these moving averages and compare them to one another. And people believe, rightly or wrongly, that that is going to help you predict the future price movement. So let's take a look at an example on slide 13. What they have here is the 50-day and the 200-day moving average. And the 50-day is red and the 200-day is, is, is green. So when the 50-day, the red one, goes above the 200-day moving average, that's supposedly a good sign, right? That's supposedly a, a bullish signal. But if it goes down, I think I got it backwards here, right? <laughs> if the cross, yeah, right. No, I got it right. I got it right. If, it go, if the 50-day goes above the 200-day moving average, that's supposedly a very good signal. If it goes below the 50-day moving average, that's supposed to be a, bear, a bad signal. And so this is just uh, showing um, as a, only a few months here. Uh, I, on the website, have a presentation using Yahoo's 50-day and 200-day moving average. And 
it shows five years, so you get to see more. You, know, you get to see more um, time. This is probably not. This is from your book, by the way. This is probably not the best example because if you're going to do a 50-day and a 200-day moving average, you probably need to see at least two or three or five years. So probably what they should have done here is they should have um, used the 15-day and the 50-day or you know, a smaller time frame. But still, you get the idea. If this goes above, the red one, which is 50-day, goes above the 200-day, that's a good sign, right? And if it goes below, that's a bad sign. Well, it gets to the situation, maybe it does, it depends how many people follow it. It becomes what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. If enough people believe that that's the truth, that that's what's going to happen, then they'll react accordingly and the price will go up or down, depending on which way it goes. But when you actually take a look at some of these, and you'll look at the one on the, on the website that I've done for you, you'll see that sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it works really, really badly because you wait too long before the average is um, across. It's already too late. It's already jumped really high or already fallen really low. So take it for what it's worth, dear students. See the presentation, and then your optional bonus assignment is to do that likewise, <laughs> is to use these moving averages and whatever other technical indicators that you want to look up and use and figure out how to use, and convince me that you know what you're talking about. You don't have to know what you're talking about. You can you you can you can play the technical analyst and make five hundred thousand dollars and not know what the hell you're talking about and get big bonuses at the end of the year, and you probably do as good a job as anybody else on Wall Street doing technical analysis. Slide number fourteen, the Dow theory. Now. I've had this explained to me by two different people, and I still don't understand it. If you can figure it out, please explain it to me. It's one of the more historically popular price movement technical theories. It uses both the industrial average, which we already know to be a, a really bad index, a really bad benchmark, and the Dow Jones transports average, which is mm, not a bad one because it takes a look at what's going on with transportation. The Dow theory tries to identify three forces a primary direction or trend, a secondary reaction or trend, and daily fluctuations. By watching the changes in the primary and secondary directions of the index, you are supposed to be able to determine the overall direction of the market. And supposedly, here's an excellent example. The primary direction is bearish, but there are secondary trends and corrections and reversions back to the primary direction which I think means that the market's going to go up and down. I think that's what that means. I'm not quite sure. If you can figure it out, please let me, let me in on, on the secret, because I can't figure it out. As far as I can, turn, can tell, the market goes up and down. That's what it means. Slide number 16. Yes, you see, I, you see, I, I try, to, try to keep a straight face, but it's hard. I try to Relative strength. This is the measure of the performance of one investment relative to another or to the market as a whole. And um, there's a, a company called Value Line that we discussed that uses what's called the relative strength indicator. They're not the only ones. Another company that's very um, uh, pop, that's very um, reliant that, that's, that, that concentrates on this relative strength indicator is Investor's Business Daily, which is a competitor to the Wall Street Journal based in L.A., Los Angeles. And there they rely on the relative strength indicator. That's, again, another technical indicator that shows, hey, this, this company is going to do well, or no, this company is not going to do well. The market volume, whether or not there's heavy volume or low volume. And we in the presentation on technical analysis, you'll, you'll see the volume indicators telling whether there's a lot of stocks being sold or not too many. And this is the, the conventional wisdom or the, the mythology, if you will. If there's heavy volume with prices rising, that's a good sign, right? Or if there's low volume with prices falling, that's okay. You know, it's all right. Prices are falling, but it's low volume. Don't worry. 
But if there's heavy volume with prices falling, uh oh, that's bad. Better run for the hills, sell all your stocks, learn to raise goats. And uh, and then if there's low volume with prices rising, well, you know, prices are rising, but it's not much volume, so that's not a good sign. Whereas the research to pr to produce this uh, this uh, so-called technical indicator, it ain't there. If you can find it, please show it to me. I'd be happy to change my mind. Slide number 17, the breath of the market. Not breath, not respiration, but, but what's going on in terms of how many stocks went up, how many stocks went down. That's called the breath. It's called the advanced decline ratio. When the mood of investors is bullish, the number of advancing issues should outnumber the number of declining issues. That's called the advanced decline ratio. So if there are more stocks going up than going down, that's supposedly a good sign. When the mood of investors is bearish, the advanced decline ratio should fall. That's a bad sign. Well, again, I think it's just telling us that the market goes up and down. And so sometimes there's going to be more, when the market's going up, there's going to be more companies going up than down. And there's going to be other times when the market prices are falling. And that means more companies will be falling than are going up. So you decide whether or not that's useful to you. And then the tick, right? Remember the poly ticks and the tick? No, 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 it's a different tick. And the name comes from the fact that there used to be these ticker machines that before the internet, <laughs> before telecommunications, that, well, they were their own method of telecommunications, that would tell you what was going on with the market, that give you quotes on stocks and the market as a whole. And so if the market goes up or if a stock goes up, that's an uptick. And if the market goes down or if an stock, individual stock goes down, that's a downtick. And the opening tick is, if, is it going up at the beginning or is it going down at the beginning? The closing tick, is it a bullish tick? Is it a bearish tick? Or is it a, um, a poly tick? <laughs> yeah, okay. I try, I try. I don't do a very good job, but I try to keep a straight face when I talk about these things. Slide number 18, short interest. Now, this one is actually pretty cool, in my humble opinion. This is the number of stocks sold short in the market at any given time, right? Now, you are going to see selling short in detail at the end of the semester, but right now all you have to know is that when people sell short, they are hoping for prices to go down or the market as a whole to go down. So the more stocks are sold short, the more investors, I think, the more traders, speculators, believe the market will fall. And for some reason, I don't know, again, where's the research? Short investors are somehow considered more sophisticated and are therefore supposed to know when the market will fall. Do you remember the discussion about Sir Maynard Keynes, Sir John Maynard Keynes, and then the sophisticated Tr speculators who expected the market to fall and they were shorting and losing their shirts. The, 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 the cool thing about this is it becomes a counter indicator. When large numbers of investors sell short, eventually they must buy back the shares. And we'll discuss how this works in detail when we get to selling short. But what happens, it's like pushing down on a spring. You're pushing down and down and down. Eventually, the spring is going to go, wee, jump up into the air. It creates a pent-up demand for stocks. So when there's a large amount of short interest, and you can look this up under key indicators, I'm sorry, key statistics for the individual stocks in Yahoo, or are there any other website that you're interested in, and see how much short interest there is in a stock. And if there's a lot of short interest, it means one of two things. Eventually, there will be a short squeeze. That's what it's called. When the, mark, when the price starts going up again, all these people have to buy back in, and bingo, it, it flies back up again. Prices will rise. Or the company's going to go out of business, in which case the short sellers won. They will have won everything that they can win because if the stock price goes to zero, they make out like bandits. So when... In 2002, in August of 2002, it was reported that the um, number of shares that had been sold short, number of short sellers, 
was at the greatest level it had ever been in the history of the New York Stock Exchange, I took very good comfort in this. Why? Because eventually those people have to buy back those shares, which creates a, a rising environment. So I felt, okay, we're close to the bottom. And it turns out we were close to the bottom. The bottom was in October of 2009. It wasn't fun. 2002, I'm sorry. October of 2002. It wasn't fun. It's never fun when the market falls, folks. Believe me, I will tell you this before you see it happen or feel it happen. But it's going to happen. You just know it's going to happen. You don't know when. So short interest is actually, I believe, a good indicator, but for all the wrong reasons. They're looking at it. The technical analysts say, oh, there's a lot of short interest. That must mean the market's going to fall. And I look at it and I say, oh, there's a lot of short interest. That means the market's eventually going to rise. But we know that, don't we? Someday, eventually, the market's going to fall, and someday, eventually, the market's going to rise. Slide number 19, odd lot trading. Again, another dubious dis uh, indicator. This is the theory based on the idea that small investors tend to buy and sell in odd lots. Remember what an odd lot is, right? Less than 100 shares. And the wisdom, for what it's worth, is the best thing to do is the opposite of what small investors are doing. Because small investors are supposedly stupider than large investors, which is, I don't know, I don't think the, the, um, the research bail, uh, bears that out. A lot of small investors are dumb, and a lot of small investors are smart. And a lot of large investors are dumb, and a lot of large investors are smart. If odd lot trading rises, it supposedly means that more and more small investors are rushing into the market. And they are supposedly notorious for getting into the market at the top of a bull market and pulling out at the bottom. Well, we know people do this. We know it happens. But the research and data behind this theory are very suspect. Plus, technology has made odd lot trading commonplace. It's, it's not a big deal anymore. You don't have to. Nobody cares if you, if you buy 17 shares versus 100 shares. It just doesn't matter because of technology. It used to be very important for the traders on the floor because it facilitated trading. But now with technology, pff, don't worry about it. Slide number 20, contrarian opinion. Well, actually, there's something to be said for this, and we've covered contrarian strategy already. You buy when others are selling, and you sell when others are buying, but there's a problem with that. The market historically has gone up three times more often than it goes down, so if you're always selling while people are buying, pretty soon you won't have anything to sell. But the contrarian opinion technical indicator is the theory that if people are optimistic, that is a predictor of falling prices for the market. And if people are very pessimistic, that's a predictor of rising prices. So here, here's part of the psychology. We should all walk around going, oh man, everything's horrible. Market's going to fall. I'll be bearish. And that will make the market rise, right? And... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could drive yourself insane, insane thinking about these things. But there is a gentleman by the name of Mark Hulbert who writes for the Wall Street Journal, MarketWatch.com. And for, what, 30 years now? Over 30 years, he has been tracking all these uh, investment newsletters, advice newsletters that sell a service. Sometimes you buy it, you know, monthly. Sometimes you buy it yearly or put a big lump sum in or whatever. And these people give out recommendations. And what he has done is he has shown that when these people all become bullish, that's a time to sell. And he's shown when all these people become bearish, that's a time to rise. So you see, these are supposed to be very sophisticated, very intelligent advisors. And yet, they're just as bad, supposedly. They do, they do just as stupid things as the, the supposedly the small investor. So contrarian opinion is a technical indicator that, in my mind, is actually pretty good. But again, you can drive yourself insane. We should all walk around and talk about how horrible everything is to make the market rise. And we shouldn't get optimistic because that will make the market fall. I like the term cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> because the alternative is that the world's going to fail, and I don't want to think about that. Slide number 21, charting. Okay, here we, here we get to the, to the meat of the technical analysis, the, uh, the heart, 
looking at little squiggles on a screen. The charting is the activity of charting price behavior and other market information and then using the patterns these charts form to make investment decisions. There are high, low, close charts, candlestick charts, which are bar charts, right, that are adapted to stocks, and chart formations. There's the resistance and the support levels until finally it breaks out. The head and the dreaded head and shoulders. Triangles, flags and pennants, cups and saucers. Supposedly this cup and saucer is something that the investor's business daily talks about all the time. So let's take a look at the open, high, low, close charts. And I'm not exactly sure what you're supposed to make of these things, but the idea is if it's red, it's gone down that day. If it's black, it's gone up. And then there's the opening, the little tick over here, and the little tick on there, and that's where it closed. And if you see a whole lot of black, that's a good sign. You see a whole lot of red, that's a bad sign. But after you see a whole lot of red, that's actually a good sign, usually. But not always, depending if the company goes out of business or not. So, I don't know. You decide whether or not it's useful to you. And then the candlestick charts. Remember the black going down. And the, the, in this case, it's not. And the other one was red and, the, and black. These are gray that's going up and then the black is going down and the longer the body the more bullish or bearish the implication may be and so here we have some candlestick chart formations and you know again I got to keep a straight face while I do this but I think it's ridiculous you look at day one the, the, the price went up on day two it went down this is a dark cloud cover Obviously not very good. But then this is a bearish, engulfing pattern. This is really not good. But then this one is supposedly horrible, and I don't know why, but it's a Japanese word, so it must be horrible. It's harami, and it, I don't know what it means. And I've asked people who speak Japanese, and they don't know what it means either. So I don't know if it is Japanese. But whatever, these are bad. They don't show you the good ones. They show you the bad ones. But you should be very, very afraid, aren't you? That's kind of like television news slide number 25 now here's the really bad one folks this is the really bad one this is called head and shoulders doesn't it look like head and shoulders you see there's the head there's the left shoulder the right shoulder and there's the neckline and that's bad don't ask me why but it's bad and on the series 7 when I took it way back in 1998 this was the only question about technical analysis all they asked you at least me when I took it was one of the most popular uh, charting examples, one of the most popular technical charts is called blank. And then the answer was head and shoulders chart. I don't know why it's bad, but it's bad. So if you see a head and shoulders, maybe it's because it's, it's associated with dandruff, right? The, uh, the shampoo by the same name. Anyway, slide number 26. And here are some, a few others that uh, are good or bad. Here's the, the resistance level. You see this, the price keeps hitting whatever it is, 15, and then can't go above that. And it goes back down to 10, so that's the support level. So it goes back up to 15, and then goes uh, down to the support level, then back up, and then down to the support, and then breaks out on the upside. It has nothing to do with the fact that their drug was just approved, right? <laughs> or that they, um, the, the market's all of a sudden doing really well because uh, there's new growth in the in the in in the economy and people are 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 happier and more optimistic no it's because there's a it's resistance and a support level and they tell you what those numbers are and then here's an another resistance and support level but it breaking down on the breaking out on the downside that's that's bad Triangles, I'm not exactly sure what that means. And flags and pennants, I really don't know what it means. But whatever, all I can say is good luck. And on the website is a spreadsheet that I want you to take a look at. Because what it does is it randomly selects a year's worth of stock returns. And I used my vast <laughs> experience with sadistics statistics and, and modeling, which I did a million years ago, and came up with a very simple spreadsheet that simply mimics a stock's price for a year. It's totally random. And I want you to, to 
uh, download that spreadsheet and open it up and then just press function key 9. And what you're going to see is sometimes these charts pop out at you. You understand? They, 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 they look beautiful. And usually they don't. You can't come up with much of anything. And it goes back to what we said at the beginning of this presentation in that Many investors, because we're heuristic animals, because we we see patterns, even though we they might not be there, whether we know it or not, they will get all excited because they see this pattern. But but the reality is it's random. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? So check that spreadsheet out and then hold down function key 9. And what you'll see is it just starts looking like white noise. And if you know anything about... Radio uh, waves and the like, and you've worked with a, an oscilloscope. You know what white noise is. It's just noise. In the short term, that's what a lot of noise, and that's what you notice if you turn on the radio or the television or go on the internet. Yes, a lot of noise from people who are trying to sell you toothbrushes and not they're not selling you cigarettes anymore, at least, but but beer and life insurance. Slide number 27. You too, dear students, can be a technical analysis. The market's rise after a period of reaccumulation is a bullish sign. Nevertheless, fulcrum characteristics are not yet clearly present and a resistance area exists 40 points higher in the Dow. So it is clearly premature to say the next leg of the bull market is up if in the coming weeks, a test of the lows holds and the market breaks out of its flag. A further rise would be indicated. Should the lows be violated, though, mm, a continuation of the intermediate term downward trend is called for. In view of the current situation, it is a distinct possibility that traders will sit in the wings awaiting a clearer distinction, sorry, delineation of the trend and the market will move in a narrow trading range. Now, this is real, folks. This is a quote from the um, a random walk down Wall Street. This is a real quote from a technical analyst. But what did he or she say? What's the uh, translation? I think what this person said is if the market does not go up or down, it will remain unchanged. Uh, do you agree with me? I mean, if you can figure it out. Yeah, I think they're saying the market could go up, the market could go down. And the market could stay the same. They're absolutely right. They <laughs> and they're making $400,000 a year, folks. But they live in New York, so it's very expensive to live there. But still. Yeah. Okay. Slide number 28. Our last slide for stocks. Careers in stocks. Now, students, I have been telling you, dear students, that the industry needs you. And it is absolutely the truth. There are tens of thousands of older folks like me who are getting ready to retire or are going to pass away. <laughs> so the industry needs you. Plus, they know that they need diversity. Forget Trump and his supporters. If you're a brokerage firm in South San Diego and you don't have somebody who speaks Spanish... You're losing business. If you're an insurance company out in the East County and you don't have somebody who speaks Arabic, Chaldean, Afghani, you're losing business. All through the county, if you don't have somebody who speaks Tagalog. Exactly. So so the industry understands that diversity is not something to be um, squashed and, and destroyed, but it's something to be embraced. And it makes us stronger. Why? Because we have varying viewpoints, varying cultures. But hey, you know, it's not coming from some fuzzy-headed, bleeding-heart liberal. It's coming from a stockbroker who wants to make money. <laughs> There's opportunity out there. So let's take a look at slide 28. And you, too, can be a registered representative, which is the, you know, that's the, the legal term for a stockbroker. But there are so many other uh, positions in the financial services industry, folks. It is a huge industry. But let's say you want to become a stockbroker. They're going to do a background check, right? They're going to ask for your fingerprints and, 
and they're going to they're going to contact the FBI to do a, a background check on you and make sure you haven't done anything with other people's monies. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You must take a very difficult uh, uh, exam called the Series Seven, and it's a six-hour exam, folks. I mean, three hours in the morning, an hour for lunch, and then three hours in the afternoon. It takes about two months of studying, one to two hours a day. I'm not. I'm serious, folks. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. And the basis of the material is our class, Business 123, Introduction to Investments. The six series 63, or some people get get take the 66, is much easier. That's the state. The states require that. It's a uh, two to weeks, two to four weeks of study. It's I uh, forget how many. It's not that many questions. And it takes about an hour to, to take the exam, so it's it's not it's not it's not a big deal. That one, the series seven is tough, and many people f uh, fail it on the first try. Why? Because they don't respect it. There are several parts of the exam, and you have to pass each part. And you don't you don't know that it doesn't it doesn't they don't break it up into different parts. They're they're throwing the questions at you from you know, from all the different parts of the exam, and the parts that get people the most are the options, the shorting, and the buying on margin, which we're going to deal with at the end of the semester, and you're going to see why these are tricky questions. And it's not that they're that difficult, it's just that they're, 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 they're tricky. And if you're not absolutely sure of which way to zig and which way to zag, you're going to zig when you should be zagging. So, without going into more detail, realize that it's a serious exam. And you must be sponsored to take the exam. Many brokerage firms are reticent to hire someone until they know that they can pass the Series 7. Normally what they do is they hire them as a broker's assistant or some other uh, uh, position. And then they train them and, and help them take the exam. But they don't know if they're going to pass it. So they don't normally like to take people unless they're sure they can pass it. So... The Financial Industry Regulatory Authority now offers the Securities Industry Essentials Exam. And you don't have to be sponsored. You don't have to get a background check. It doesn't cost five, six, seven hundred dollars. It's what, sixty bucks or eighty bucks? And you can take it before you um start applying for jobs. And that will show you Show them, not show you, show the world that, yeah, I'm serious. And again, the, the material we're learning here forms the basis of this exam. So check out the exam at finra.org and think about it, dear students. Think about it. I love it. I love it. As we said before, the, the, the biggest thing, in my humble opinion, is biggest things, I should say, do you like working with people? Even the jerks, right? <laughs> do you do you have basically an optimistic, sunny disposition and look forward to the future? And most importantly, will you never give up? Will you ask 26 people <laughs> if they need help and the 27th one says, well, maybe, let's talk. So it, it, there are, you know, it's not perfect, nothing is, but... I really love it. And have, have have I mentioned, I think I have, that the salaries are higher than the national averages? Uh, yes. And, 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 and you, you'd be surprised at how many older folks are still in the industry and don't want to leave because you don't have to break your back in this case. But it can be stressful, especially if you go into mortgage broking. Those people work the hardest. Um but they make the most money. Insurance agents, it's a great job because everybody needs insurance. If you go into banking, you know, banking is so huge, so you, you'll find your way. But, of course, my favorite is is the brokerage firms. And, again, there are just so many positions. You don't have to be a stockbroker, right? There are just so many positions available in the industry. So think about it, dear students. We know you're going to be successful. And slide 29, we're done. Stocks, that is. No, we're never done stocks. Stocks are 
so wide-ranging. There are thousands of them out there, folks. You'll never, there are so many different types of strategies and, and models and, and uh, formulas that you can use and play with and, and different, different um, uh, you know, as we said, different strategies, value versus growth and, and <clears throat> um, you know, con contrarianism, aggressive growth my favorite buy and hold that you will never stop learning about stocks okay great so i hope you've enjoyed our discussion of stocks these few last many weeks because now we're ready <laughs> to get started with bonds boring bonds stodgy bonds reliable bonds Thank you so much for being in our class, dear students. We are always so happy and honored and privileged that you are here with us.